So I'm gonna now maybe start <laughs> by uh, um, introducing uh, Professor Andrea Smith. Um, and uh, she's gonna talk about the walking purchase of 1737. Um, she's a professor of anthropology at the Department of Anthropology and Sociology at Lafayette uh, College Easton, uh, where she has taught since 1999. Uh, she researches settler colonialism, memory and power, nostalgia, erasure, and place loss, uh, working with settlers of French Algeria and now U.S. public monuments. Her first monograph, Colonial Memory in Postcolonial Europe, um, uh, received the Douglas Prize for the Society of, the, of Anthropology. Um, and uh, in 2016, she published Rebuilding Shattered Worlds for Re Recollection, Creating Community by Voicing the Past uh, by University of Nebraska Press uh, with Anna Eisenstein. Uh, this book, book uh, explores how a demolished Eastern neighborhood is remembered by elderly former residents. Her most recent book, Memory Wars, Settlers and Natives Remember Washington's Sullivan Expedition of 1779, is forthcoming with the University of Nebraska Press and explores the Sullivan campaign in public commemorative projects in Pennsylvania, New York. So uh, I'm gonna now uh, give the floor to Andrea. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. It's really a pleasure to be here today. Um, thank you, Boaz. Thank you, um, Lois. And I'd like to also thank the friends of the Lehigh University Libraries for the invitation and Scott Gordon in particular for suggesting my name. I want to also say that I'm speaking from the ancestral lands of the Lenape in New Jersey and um, also known as the Delawares. So I'm going to start by um, sharing my screen. Okay, whoops, let's see if you, you cannot see that. <laughs> okay, I think this is right. Only I have to take this off. There. So does that look good? I see it, it's awesome. Okay, great. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so let me get started. Um, in 1966, a Bangor school teacher, Mrs. Emery, wrote to the Pennsylvania Historical and Museum Commission alerting them about a missing historical plaque, including one about Marshall, she wrote, the infamous walking purchase one, as she put it in her letter. The commission's field curator replied that the plaque was simply a way under repair. He didn't correct her wording, but the marker in question commemorated a famous Indian walk. Ooh, okay, there, oh, there we go. A famous Indian walk, not an infamous one. Emery's mistake was not surprising for the trickery involved in this 18th century land transaction was not news in the 1960s. It was also not news in the 1920s when the markers went up. Even a paper read at the meeting of the Moravian Historical Society in 1910, which found the transaction relatively sound, emphasizes again and again the trickery and deceit practiced by the whites, in quotes. So described almost universally in historical and other accounts as the notorious, shameful, or deceitful walking purchase, the trans land transaction was understood on wrong as wrong on so many levels and was certainly not something that you would think state officials would want to elevate with a grand public commemoration. This is surprising because to commemorate is usually to honor, to elevate an event or a person. Unlike so many of the monuments and other commemorative memorials that are under discussion today, when these markers were established in 1925, few people saw the event as laudatory. In this paper, I will try to show how it was that the Pennsylvania Historical Commission established four um, historical markers to what they renamed as the famous Indian Walk. As a memory scholar, I'm interested in the uses of the past and the present most generally. Why are certain stories elevated and revered with, pub with historical 
pageantry, public commemorations, and the installation of monuments and markers, while other stories are neglected. Is this merely a question of who has the necessary political, financial, or social capital? Long after their, their founders are gone, do these markers continue to shape how a past story reverberates in the present day? Do people pay attention to the historical markers in our midst? Any story of a historical marker will be as much about the era of its establishment as about the historical event a historical event or person being recognized, as sociologists James Lowen and others have argued. Markers, you could say, are a story of two eras. For instance, most projects celebrating the heroes of the Confederacy date not to the immediate aftermath of the Civil War, but to Reconstruction, a time of terrible racial violence. It's only when considering this wider context that the full meaning and message of these markers becomes clear. Um, the following study suggests that our national commemorative landscape does not necessarily reflect consensus or wide public approval. We'll be looking at a cast of characters that were involved in the 1925 markers. We're going to find that the markers, like in many other cases, result from a series of random events and idiosyncratic personalities. This story tells us much about the decentralized nature of public history making in the United States and the outsized role that individuals have played in deciding which stories are recognized on the landscape and how. A situation that, that, that did not change even after a state organization designed to take charge of the historical landscape was created. So here's where we, this is what we're gonna be doing today. Um, we'll be looking at how we can understand Pennsylvania's walking purchase markers, which were established in the 20s. I'll be asking who was involved and what their goals were. I'll briefly review the circumstances behind this land transaction. I'll then turn to its commemoration in the 1920s, situating this project within the context of the newly formed Pennsylvania Historical Com Commission. I'll then explore the markers through the lens of settler colonial theory. And we'll be looking at how we could see these um, inaugural, inauguration ceremonies as kind of lasting ceremonies, attempts by white settlers to establish a kind of historical capital on their land as well, and adding status and prestige to their homes and their estates. And so this is kind of the overall um, order of this talk today. Okay. So first, the very brief review of the walking purchase. Um, the walking purchase, what was this? This was a fraudulent land transaction carried out by William Penn's sons and several Delaware leaders in 1737. It involved selling an amount of land measured by how far a man could walk in a day and a half, thus its name. I'm only going to briefly review this land transaction. You can see it's the um, on this. Um, image here, it is the part that is stippled, where it says 1737. I'll only briefly review it because this topic is the focus of an abundant literature, an excellent literature, and here are some names if you're interested in delving deeply into this story. It makes no sense to duplicate these efforts, even if I were to review these books here, it would take up my entire talk today. So I will, this will be very, for those of you who have written about this, this will be very brief. Um, so when William Penn received a charter to what became Pennsylvania in 1682 from Charles II, he imagined his new territory, as Stephen Harbor puts it, as not simply a political experiment, but more as a holy experience. A hallmark of his holy experience was to devise a less warlike relationship with the land's indigenous inhabitants. So in this colony, only the proprietors could sell land. And before they did, they made sure to clear title by paying Native Americans for the parcels in question. Many scholars have pointed out that this was dispossession nevertheless. Moreover, the Native peoples in Penn and his representatives had very different ideas about what these transactions meant, about land use, about whether land was, inali was alienable or not, and tensions surfaced almost immediately. Penn was in Pennsylvania twice, William Penn. During his first visit, he signed several deeds with Delawares. 
in what Harper calls Pennsylvania Quaker folklore. In one of these agreements, there was, there was a, um, a sale for land west and north of a prior purchase that would involve Penn and Delaware representatives walking north together for three days, then purchasing land from that point east to the Delaware River. The story says that after a day and a half, Penn felt that he had enough land and agreed that the next walk would be made at some later time. We don't know if this first walk occurred and if it was during Penn's first or second stay, if it had occurred. Most scholars agree that the 1686 agreement that is often mentioned later was never finalized, whether or not it occurred in the story or not. At any rate, after Penn's death, his sons, Thomas, John, and Richard became in charge of Pennsylvania. Um, Thomas came to Pennsylvania first while his brothers remained behind and they wrote to him about their ever increasing debts. Penn was in debtor's prison for a great deal of times so the family was broke. At one point, the brothers knowingly abandoned the policy of obtaining clear title from Delaware's before selling land to settlers in order to pay down the family debts. Sales in the area of the Forks of the Delaware, which is where the Lehigh and the Delaware connect, which is where Easton is today, occurred well before the Indian Walk. Large tracts were sold to speculators like William Allentown of Allentown fame. The Penn brothers became increasingly eager to purchase lands in the Forks of the Delaware for their own interest, um, because to make good on sales they had already made, and also to sell to pay off more debts. They met with Delaware leaders in 1734 and 1735, and they recalled the earlier land agreement, supposedly from, 17, from 1686, involving the day and a half walk. But they had no documents and the Delawares refused to sell. At a second meeting, their land agent, James Logan, presented a copy of the 1686 document as well as witnesses who remembered the land transaction the Delawares continued to refuse to sell. So their agents involved the Iroquois to put pressure on the Delawares. And then they presented a very misleading map designed to confuse, which Harper and some other scholars have looked at. The map, it appears, was what, was what convinced the Delawares to agree to the deal because it looked as if there was not gonna be a whole lot of land in the, in the transaction. So when four Delaware sachems agreed to this walking purchase in 1737, um, and here is a copy of, of the agreement. They had no idea that the brothers had been ordering secret land surveys, that they had sold thousands of acres of land illegally already, and that they had even carried out a trial walk with two of the three final walkers. So um, the walk took place on September 19, 1737, and it didn't go at all as the Delawares had expected. The walkers didn't follow the winding Delaware River. And if you take a look at this map, you can see the if you followed the river for a day and a half, it would take a lot longer than if you took a straight line. Um, the trees had been blazed in advance. The walkers had practiced a year before, or two years before, and they didn't take breaks. Moreover, the proprietors had promised 500 acres for the walker who covered the most terrain. The fastest man, Edward Marshall, practically ran and covered more than 60 miles. Some scholars suggest that they took stimulants and a half an hour at the end of the walk, another runner fell, turned blind and then died. <laughs> Finally, when the rock walk was over, Rather than drawing a line straight to the river, and you can see on this map here, that's why I have this map from um, an old um, history. If you took the line straight to the river, you would have a much smaller amount of land. Instead, they drew a line perpendicular to the final point at the end of the walk, which led to securing a vast amount of land. Um, here, I'll, I'll turn this here. Vast amount of land, 700,000 acres, a bit smaller than the state of Rhode Island. Thomas Penn apparently wrote to his brothers that this purchase in quotes, takes in as much ground as any person here ever expected and at no great expense. The Delaware complaints about this purchase occurred during the walk and immediately afterwards, and they refused to leave the land in the forks of the Delaware, even while the white sellers were settling around them. And so I just have this, uh, like this series of, of deceptive 
activities that are not in dispute that people, that historians recognize took place. Um, okay. They refused to leave the land. They filed a formal, formal complaint to the Pennsylvania Chief Justice in 1740. And the next year, the proprietors reached out to the Iroquois to help remove the Delawares in 1742. The story continues. At a turning point in the Seven Years' War, the French and Indian War, um, the Delawares went on, an, on the attack, killing over 100 people in Northampton County. And here is a map of the land, this is from Harper, of the land that um, in dark was obtained by the walking purchase. And you can see, hopefully you can see here, Bethlehem and Easton are listed in there. So the people that were attacked during the Seven Years' War were often living in the area of the what the Delawares considered a fraudulent um, transaction. Um, some people in Northampton County expressed surprise at these attacks, but others um, just said that this was due to the discontent sowed by the walking purchase. A series of meetings were held in Easton in 1756, 57, and 1762, during which time Delaware leader Tidiuskun laid out complaints about the action of the Penn's brother in the entire walking purchase transaction. So this information is very carefully documented in the record. It suffices to say that while these complaints were very clearly um, outlined, they weren't necessarily positively received and the outcome was not positive for the Delawares. The few was reframed as an effort to vindicate, uh, reframed and it vindicated the proprietor's case. I'll just say that um, historians have continued to revisit this story that, and this story is widely known and widely shared among descendant communities of Lenape who are found in every state of the United States and in sizable numbers in these communities here. So this story is very much alive. Okay. So now I'm gonna move forward a couple hundred years. So that is kind of a summary of the walking purchase. In 1927, Henry Shoemaker, the chair of the Pennsylvania Historical Commission, brought the commission's attention to bootleg monuments found across the state. And he asked if it would make sense to develop legislation to prevent the erection of markers and monuments without the authority of the commission, he said. The bootleg mon monuments he was talking about were a longstanding practice. Before the Pennsylvania Historical Commission was formed in 1913, there was no state or federal oversight for what went up on our landscape. Most markers were so-called bootleg markers. The prevailing assumption for much of US history was that the governments bore no responsibility for matters of collective memory, an attitude that persisted well into the 1930s. As historian Michael Kamen has put it, if people wanted to commemorate an anniversary or save a site, they would have to take the initiative. The time, the energy, and above all, the money would have to come from them. This early orientation has had a tremendous influence on the U.S. monumental landscape. In the absence of federal direction and resources, most U.S. markers were developed by wealthy benefactors, local organizations, or civic and patriotic societies. Local elites, as a result, have been able to do dominate the public face of the national past to a degree difficult to measure. Not only were local elites predominantly white, leading to a kind of white landscape, of like historical landscape, but also local initiative almost necessarily elevated only certain people and their stories on the land. And finally, local control led to an invasion of uncomfortable pasts. As sociologist James Lowen has pointed out, local control means, in quote, the, light will the site will tell a story favorable to the local community. The story usually told is that, in quotes, everything that happened here was good. Okay, so when the Pennsylvania Historical Commission was created in 1913, they had their work cut out for themselves, the five members, their volunteers, and they're charged with, in quotes, marking and preserving the antiquities and historical landscapes of Pennsylvania, preserving or restoring ancient or historic public buildings and military works, and receiving bequests of relics and other articles of historical interest. They were supposed to carry out these activities on their own, but they were also supposed to respond to any municipalities or historical societies who wanted help. Um, 
the inaugural members decided right away, they concluded unanimously that they would start by engaging in inquiry just to find out what historical markers existed on the land to begin with. They found an astounding diversity of monumental types, forms, and funders. Along with the memorials that the state had funded to mark the Civil War dead, there were countless privately sponsored monuments that were established across the last century. Shoemakers bootleg monuments recognize the birthplace of prominent people, sites important to local industry, like the building of John Fitch's steamboat, um, locations of Revolution War fame. There was the point where Lafayette received his first wound, a terracotta column erected by children of Chester County. Multiple markers and commemorated encounters or conflicts with indigenous people. And you can see here, this is just a collection of some of the organizations involved with establishing markers in the landscape in Pennsylvania. The commission's first compilation of state markers included the disclaimer, this does not pretend to be a complete list. It has been impossible to secure such within the limits of the compiler's employment. Private organizations have been active. But now taking charge, the commission members had a problem. They had very little funding. And so they had to collaborate with the very organizations whose markers they deplored. The first foray into public history making was the Fort McCord Memorial, and it would raise eyebrows today. What they did is they assisted the already existing Enoch Brown Association in completing a monument to an event from the Seven Years' War. The marker was in the form of a Celtic cross and it celebrated a so-called massacre with an inscription that embraced anti-Indian savagism. It talked about people being massacred by savages and carried off into captivity. In their annual report, the commission wrote that the monument should be an inspiration to other communities, however. This praise was not due to the marker's religious motif, to its message, or even its historical significance, but rather because of its cost. As the PHC explained, the land was donated as was much of its work. They said they provided funds to demonstrate the commission's willingness to, in quote, help those who help themselves, end quote. So the story of the walking purchase markers follows in this pattern. The commission that created them was appointed by a progressive governor, Gifford Pinchot. Like the previous commissions, this group's tenure was hampered by chronic funding shortages. Pinchot appointed his longtime friend and fellow conservationist, Henry Shoemaker as chairman and Quaker historian, Albert Cook Myers as secretary. Chief Joseph Strongwolf will be featured later on, and he was in every single marker unveiling. Henry Chapman, we're gonna hear about, opposed the walking purchase markers. Okay, so let's start. I'm gonna talk a little bit about these characters here now for a minute. Um, so it's gonna be a little, whole bunch of white guys and some other people. Um, Shoemaker was ultimately responsible for the markers. He's best known today for becoming the first state folklorist. He was born in a wealthy New York City family with relatives from both sides in, from Pennsylvania. His grandfather became what made a fortune in Schuylkill County coal. His father continued to manage these mines and then expanded into railroads and finally moving the family to New York City where they were part of the new money elite of the Gilded Age. They live right next door to John D. Rockefeller and they were regular features in New York society's pages. Henry's second marriage was big news when he received the largest wedding gift of New York real estate ever recorded, which offers some measure of the family's wealth. Henry's early schooling was with private tutors. He then started Columbia at age 16. The family regularly returned to his mother's um, homestead in, near Lock Haven, Pennsylvania. A biographer notes that in the Shoemaker family, they talked about Pennsylvania as if it were a foreign land wrapped up in nostalgia, the beloved old country. Henry's interests were drawn to writing mythology in the outdoors, and he was an avid mountaineer. He turned away from the family's railroad enterprises and was increasingly drawn to progressive agendas, especially conservation issues. 
He purchased newspapers and was a prolific writer of editorials, promoting progressive causes, writing against monopolies, and the exploitation of corporations of natural resources, which is kind of ironic given the source of his family's wealth. Um, he was known to support social causes. By the 1910s, a colleague described his causes as, in quote, saving the wild, protecting the colored people, and fighting the exploitation of immigrants. He was also a public servant in Pennsylvania for over 40 years. Um, he was partly, he was state archivist for a while and also um, was an abundant, prolific writer. He tried to elevate the common Pennsylvania man and woman with his folklore, like sort of folksy folklore um, publications. And he would collect these by doing, conducting oral history research all around Pennsylvania. His publications carry this kind of romantic flavor with covers that often feature rustic scenes or Native Americans in bucolic settings. Let's look at Myers now. Myers was actually um, six years his, uh, Shoemaker's senior. He grew up in Adams County, Pennsylvania. He, moved, he went to Swarthmore. He was a practicing Quaker his entire life. After getting a bachelor's in Swarthmore, he got a master's. He was on the faculty there for a couple of years, and then he started studying history and graduate programs, but he went to Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Harvard, and never really finished a doctorate and never had an academic position after that. He spent his life compiling William Penn's papers, and he stayed in Pennsylvania where he worked on many high-profile um, positions in historical commissions as secretary, the Valley Forge Park Commission, the William Penn 1932 commemoration, and so forth we will see that he was sometimes quite difficult to deal with. Um, so Shoemaker and Myers had four years to make their mark on the, on their, their, to make their mark on the commission. And at first they seemed to be a perfect team. In a note after an early meeting, Shoemaker writes, I cannot begin to tell you how much good my day with you yesterday did me. And I feel we're getting straightened out towards accomplishing something. Um, Shoemaker often seemed to be concerned about the accomplishments of other commissions and sometimes was concerned that um, people were talking about how they weren't getting anything done. So his letters are constantly pushing Myers forward. Um, when they first started working together, Shoemaker realizes right away that Myers needed a secretary. So one of the funny things about Myers, even though he served as secretary for many different historical commissions, he did not know how to type. And so they constantly needed to hire a secretary for him. This is the minutes at first were submitted like this. And then Shoemaker writes to him several times saying, look, we got to change this. Um, Shoemaker also assisted in securing a driver. He also did not drive, but he had to travel all around the state um, to look at these marker dedications and to set them up. And so um, here's a picture of the secretary and his driver of the time. Okay. They um, immediately had trouble because the other commission members were elderly and lived far, you know, in different parts of Pennsylvania, and it was hard for them to get together. At one point, Myers was so frustrated about poor attendance at the meetings that he suggested they hold their next meeting at the Harrisburg Hospital <laughs> um, because of members were constantly in and out of the hospital and sick. Um, much of the correspondence between Shoemaker and Myers was just trying to figure out how they're going to meet up. While they seemed to be a team and Shoemaker was ultimately in charge, it was Myers who was in the trenches and he was also Myers who was paid for his services. Despite these difficulties during the second half of 1924, the PHC, Pennsylvania Historical Commission, erected 10 bronze markers on sites related to Penn's biography or early Native American villages. So here's a picture of um, Myers in front of Port Shirley. This is kind of a classic situation. And here's a list of the markers that they ended up establishing. So the first year, um, they have many different Native American towns that are being commemorated for the most part. So let's talk about the walking purchase. Myers first started looking into the idea of commemorating the walking purchase in 1924. Why would he be interested in doing this? Um, most of the other markers under his tenure traced out Penn's biography 
and tracing Penn's life was Meyer's life work. He brought the Penn Charter back to Philadelphia with great fanfare. You can see there's um, Strong Wolf again, and, and Myers is on the left with the governor receiving the charter. Um, he may have thought, may have been attempting to recuperate the reputations of Penn's children. On several occasions, he suggested that he had found the missing 1686 deed in London, assertions that were repeated in the news media. This information was so widely shared that an amateur historian wanted to ask for a copy of it. In developing his plans for the walking purchase markers, he crossed swords with a third man in our story, Henry Mercer. So let's now turn to him. Many of you probably know about Henry Chapman Mercer, born in Doylestown to an elite family, graduated from Harvard, admitted to the Philadelphia bar, but then drawn to other fields and he studied archeologists. So he's known as an early American archeologist at first. He conducted excavations and ends up working for the Penn Museum for three years. He eventually left archeology. span He was particularly close to an aunt who had widowed young, married to a very wealthy Italian man and stayed in Florence. So he traveled to Europe quite a lot. He was drawn to anti-modernist movements and the arts and crafts movement. He would write that industrialization was destroying America and so forth. And he ended up developing a tile works company, resurrecting a, a sort of dying tradition of tile making and won lots of prizes for the tiles. So this became an actual commercial enterprise. But also during his archeological trips, he started collecting old tools and old farming implements. And this carried on. He also is known for developing a new way of building with concrete. And so he develops a gigantic museum in which to store his tools. Um, some people say he was a real Renaissance man. So that's Mercer. Mercer was the president of the Bucks County Historical Society. Um, when these various characters cross paths. So the Bucks, um, some of the walking purchase territory goes through Bucks County um, and the Bucks County Historical Society with Mercer's direction had developed a marker to the Lenape. And you can see it, the, what it says is sort of in the middle of this slide, to the memory of the Lenape and Lenape Indians, ancient owners of this region and then it has just briefly the starting point of the Indian walk, raw. So they had this marker, this was written out across a stone. Myers visited this site with other members of the Friends Historical Society in the 1920s, before he was on the Historical Commission. And then he listened to a talk about the early Quaker residents of Wrightstown. He first started suggesting to cre creating mark markers to the walking purchase when he wrote to Henry Mercer in 1924. I hope sometime a series of markers may be established along the line of the famous walking purchase. What do you think of that? He writes, I have found no response from Mercer, but the record suggests that it was negative because in March the next year, Myers was still looking for co-sponsors for his marker. So just to kind of back up again, Myers and Shoemaker are supposed to create a bunch of markers, but they don't have enough funds and they always have to have a partnership with another organization in order to get enough resources to develop their markers. Okay, so he's trying to reach out to this, this historical society to co-sponsor the marker and he's getting nowhere. Mercer's hesitancy may have had something to do with what I'm calling the PlayWiki affair because um, the two cross paths then as well. PlayWiki was another site that Mer Myers ended up um, marking. It was a Delaware town mentioned in early Penn correspondence, but its location was unclear to layers, later sellers. It was a matter, matter of some local interest and members of the Bucks County Historical Society tried to resolve it in the twenties, way before this, before they started thinking about markers. Henry Mercer had identified a farm where he thought the town might have been, a former Delaware town. Um, My Myers found a deed that suggested he knew where it was. 
So in June of 1923, Myers, Mercer, and the entire Bucks County Historical Society hold a meeting at a site in question. And it was a known place where relic collectors were constantly um, you know, hoarding items. So it may have been an actual village. Mercer digs at the time in front of everybody, finds some charcoal, finds some artifacts, and they declare that the site is PlayWiki. The meeting is reported in the Bulletin of the Friends Historical Society. So you'd think that would be settled. But despite the publication of this communal effort, dramatic press coverage picked up in media sources around the country, and this is from the San Angelo Evening Standard, declares that Albert Cook Myers has discovered the location of PlayWiki, and it gives no mention of anybody else involved. It's a solo discovery. So after all this transpired is when Myers gets back in touch with Mercer and says, hey, um, what sites have you developed? And Mercer responds rather tartly, the list of all sites marked by our society is given in the preface of volume one of our proceedings. So you get a sense of a very cool relationship. In the same letter, he writes to Mercer, I hope that you will favor my proposal for putting up a marker at PlayWiki. He didn't say in his letter that he had already announced to the press that he was gonna do a marker to PlayWiki. So you can see that Myers is constantly trying to get attention to himself or to kind of take charge without involving others. This story goes on and, it, and it's kind of ridiculous, but basically Bucks County Historical Society decides to mark PlayWiki they announce their intention. They have a plan. By April, they've ordered the stone. They have a date of June 23rd. They start organizing with the landowners to um, get the deed set. And at the Pennsylvania Historical Commission meeting in May, um, Myers basically declares that he's going to make a marker to play with he. And so he's going to kind of trump their whole plan. So the Bucks County Historical Society has to back down. They have to tell the stonemaker to deliver the stone somewhere else. And there's a big hoopla. So the play with the affair kind of ends with Myers getting his way and marking the place himself. In a discussion of settler public memory, David Glassberg writes that often the most important part of a historical marker is the attribution. And this certainly seems to be the battle of two organizations trying to carry out a similar kind of tri tribute with the state commission winning out. Um, so Myers goes ahead, he gets a marker established to play wiki. Bucks County does not help him co-sponsor it. And instead you can see he finally got the Pennsylvania Society of the Colonial Dames of America to co-sponsor it. This is a hereditary organization um, of women descendant of people who were here during the colonial times, of ancestors here during the colonial times, and just by invitation only. So it's a very elite kind of organization. I went on this tangent to capture a bit more the reasons why Mercer and Myers were not collaborating with the walking purchase markers or why there was perhaps a difficulty. So back to the walking purchase plan. Myers is still looking for sponsors. Um, the Society of Pennsylvania Women, another organization, also turns them down. As Shoemaker explains, they felt the event was not worthy of commemoration. Their director called Shoemaker and said they did not want to memorialize an injustice to the Indians. And Shoemaker writes to Myers, I think their position is a good one. Give her kindly a list of other places they can find to put markers up. Myers needed a co-sponsor to help pay for the walking purchase signs. And he seemed to have raised the ire of Mercer. The Pennsylvania women were not interested and even Shoemaker was not interested. How could he go about with his plans? He did so despite all of, this, um, all of this, these obstacles. And here's what I've been able to reconstruct. Shoemaker's planning a trip to Europe in 1925. Myers is perturbed. Shoemaker reassured him that during my proposed absence abroad, you are certainly authorized to perform any services and accept any responsibilities would have devolved to me. 
In my absence, you would be, in a sense, acting chairman of the commission. This reassurance was not enough. So at the May meeting before Shoemaker left, the commissioners voted to grant Myers almost full power. And you can see his, his um, abbreviations ACM. So Shoemaker, they vote to kind of create a situation where Myers is secretary, treasurer, and curator. And then they also put in the minutes that Myers has sole authority to act on his own in any way he wants during the absence of the chairman from the country. So as soon as Shoemaker gets on the boat to go to Paris, Myers begins planning the walking purchase markers. He starts contacting landowners, he starts arranging for dedication speakers, and he starts arranging marker wording. He ultimately places two markers in Northampton County and two in Bucks County, securing four deeds for different plots of land and getting all the necessary funding. So let me start. The Northampton County historical, the Northampton County markers, Edelman Mill and Hawkendakwa Indian Town, were put together, funded by the Northampton County Historical Society, but there is no record in the minutes of any discussion of this. It appears to have been carried out rather quietly. The markers appear in the minutes only after the grand unveiling in September 1925. And um, even though the, the markers themselves say that Northampton County um, Historical and Genealogical Society funded them, the society minutes discuss any number of other activities and markers, but only this only appears in the October minutes. And at the time, there's already a marker fund that has been created. And so they basically approve sending money from the marker fund to pay for the markers. Um, they also say in the minutes that they're going to have a list of people who donated to the marker fund, and I haven't found that list. Okay, so that's, that's kind of interesting. The markers did not seem to represent a groundswell of local interest, if this society didn't discuss it, and even local politicians didn't really know about it. Mayor Gross of Allentown was surprised, and he wrote to Myers in August saying, I think it's gonna be some kind of tablet erected in Northampton County, a few miles from our city, he writes, and he, want, he asks for more information. Shoemaker learns about these plans when Myers forwarded a letter regarding the deeds being donated by the Scranton Trust. The trust secretary said the commission could have the lots as long as they maintain the property. So Myers forwards the letter to Shoemaker as soon as he gets back to the country, this is in August, with a note saying, please wire me at once whether the commission can meet the above requirements. I think we can commit ourselves. The marker site is a good one at Northampton. Shoemaker sent the letter back with a note scrawled in the margins, I feel we cannot commit ourselves that far. So it's unclear how Shoemaker and Myers worked out their differences, but they eventually did. And Shoemaker managed to attend these two marker uh, unveilings held in September. So here they are. Um, so this is one, um, you can see, uh, there's Joseph Strongwolf and then to the right, Shoemaker, and then right next to him is Myers with his arm around somebody. Um, despite opposing the walking purchase markers, Shoemaker expressed support and was positive in his interactions with Myers after that. I now wanna look at the, um, there's the plaque. It's really quite wordy. And it mentions the Native American um, people who, the, the Sacums who were part of the treaty and so forth. And then also the fleet footed youth, Edward Marshall, who is actually sounds like a pretty terrible man, but anyway, in other sources. Um, then here's the Edelman marker unveiling. And I wanna say something about the order of the events and what was going on at these events. You, um, oftentimes Boy Scouts were part of these unveilings and I believe that they are dressed in some kind of outfit here. Um, you can see mostly men, you would usually have um, a descendant unveil the marker. So you have two young girls and they're descendants of the original um, mill millers. Here is uh, some of the program 
for the marker unveilings. There are kind of grand programs that were developed for each of these marker unveilings for all of the ones that um, Shoemaker and Myers were involved with. You can see that Henry Shoemaker as chairman is the chairman of the thing. So was the, the president of the historical society. So this is classic, whatever the organization was that co-sponsored would be up at the top of the program. You always had in all of these an invocation of the great spirit by chief strong wolf. And I'll talk about him in a minute. Then often the person giving the deed was one of the more um, had a higher status in the program. And so this is a way for the landowner to get some credit for giving the land and the marker was often in front of their property. So I see these as ways of kind of adding value to their own real estate by having a historical marker placed in front of their own land. Um, then sometimes there was speeches. And so that's what you have here. This is kind of classic for all of the markers. So this is the Edelman Mill walking purchase marker dedication. Okay, so Myers managed to get the two Northampton County ones, Bucks County still having a problem. So what he decides to do is he kinds of works around Mercer by going directly to the vice president of the historical society, a man named Benjamin Franklin Fackenthal. There he is. So Benjamin Fackenthal was an industrialist. He was the president of the Thomas Iron Company. And he's the son of a man who graduated from Lafayette before that. Um, here he is. This is, these images are from a program, uh, I mean, from a 50th anniversary brochure that was given to stakeholders. And they had quite a few operations. I put this partly because this is a Lehigh <laughs> event. So some of you might be interested. So here is a kind of, it's in the 1920s, a time of great industrialization, also moving against, against that. So we have people who are uh, opposed to industry and people who are smack dab in the middle of it in this story. So this is a plant. So this is the same town, the same site. You know, the creek is, Hakandakwa Creek is kind of where the Hakandakwa village supposedly was found, which is one of the markers that was done in Northampton County. Okay, same place. Um, and you can even see here in the, in, in this um, 50th anniversary program, it says our Hakandakwa works are located on the opposite side of Lehigh River. Our real estate therefore is not included in the lands taken from the Indians by that much questioned walking purchase. Okay, so here he is, Fackenthal. So basically Myers convinces Fackenthal to give the keynote speech at one of the Bucks County walking purchase marker dedications. And I think they think that they will convince Mercer to go along with co-sponsoring it. Mercer hears of these plans from Fackenthal and he hits the roof and he decides that there is no way Bucks County Historical Society will ever have anything to do with these walking purchase monuments. What were the causes for concern? Well, first he says the wrong done to the Indians. He's just furious. But second, he's upset that Mer Myers proceeded with his plans without ever consulting Mercer personally or as president of the Historical Society. So they already had their plans in place. This caused an immediate problem. So a lot of correspondence back and forth. The program is going to have to be changed. You can't list the Bucks County Historical Society. You have to take it off the tablet and you have to take anything identifying me that way as well, Fackenthal says. How are they going to fund it? Well, they're going to have to create a collection. So this leads to this rapid development of a committee of interested citizens. Um, and you can see Fackenthal is vice, one of the vice chairmen. In the end, they received money to pay for the marker to the penny. They collected donations at the marker and failing, in fact. Um, but Fackenthal played by, paid by far the largest amount. So he's essentially funding a dedication for which he's the keynote speaker. Okay, so here are the Bucks County dedications that go through despite opposition. And it's the same kind of discussion. You can see here, Fackenthal gives a talk about the lunching place. And here we have Chief Strong Wolf and some Boy Scouts. Um, and here's the Gallows Hill one. Okay. 
So I'm going to try to back up here a little bit, and we're going to start talking about Strong Wolf and what is going on. Um, I, before I do, let me just say one thing. Mercer knew Myers and Shoemaker well. And I find it interesting that during the entire period of discussion, Mercer and Shoemaker were carrying out robust correspondence, but they never once mentioned marker unveilings, the walking purchase, Myers, or anything else like that. They connected on their passion for folk material culture. And so while Myers is working on these markers and battling it out with Mercer, Mercer and Shoemaker are writing letters back and forth about tools, um, lumber, shoemakers meeting lumbermen, and he's get, he's purchasing handmade axes for Mercer's museum and so forth. So it's kind of interesting that um, that was just not a topic of conversation. So let's look at markers in another way. So settlers societies are colonial societies in which the settlers come to stay. They settle the land and in the process develop a new society with the aim, according to settler colonial theory, right? Um, the aim of replacing the land's original inhabitants and their social and cultural and political systems. They are founded on what Patrick Wolf calls a logic of elimination with the elimination of native people as a kind of fundamental basis for settler society. This elimination has occurred through warfare, decimation by disease, removal, and land transactions among many other mechanisms. This logic, while of course has not been carried out to completion, thankfully, is an underlying structure of the society that follows. And it influences how settlers come to imagine their place in the time, their place on the land, their relationship to their new home and their collective history. In her masterpiece, Firsting and Lasting, Anishinaabe historian, Jean O'Brien, examines 19th century New England local history texts and she argues that they construct replacement narratives through which settler colonists explain to themselves how they came to replace the territory's indigenous inhabitants. These origin myths, she calls them, assign primacy to non-Indians who settled the region in a so-called benign process involving righteous relations with Indians and just property transactions that led to an inevitable but lamentable Indian extinction. So she's writing about how 19th century New Englanders like to imagine their history. The origin myths for Pennsylvania were similar, as we will see. These replacement narratives were developed with the rhetorical strategies of firsting, she calls them, and lasting. Local histories obsessively documented firsts, the first white baby born, the first settlement, the first house, the first church, and so forth indirectly asserting that it was non-Indians who were the first people worthy of recognition. And in this way, they claim indigeneity for themselves. At the same time, they also engaged in lasting, establishing monuments and texts about the last or vanishing Native American whom they were replacing. And the New Englanders lamented the loss of the last remnant of this or that Indian nation, a settler fantasy that was sometimes repeated many times in the same town because of course native people had not vanished and still have not vanished, thankfully. The PHC markers that Myers and Shoemaker developed helped to construct a replacement narrative quite similar to that developed in New England. In the Pennsylvania origin story, William Penn created a peaceable kingdom and engaged in fair and respectful land transactions with his indigenous neighbors, the story goes. By marking out stages in Penn's life, People in the PHC were also engaged in firsting. You know, they're helping to describe on the land where Penn lived, his first home, his second home. They're marking out stages in his biography. They're also engaging in lasting by marking out um, Native American village sites. Scholars in Native American studies and historiography have long noted blind spots in American historical consciousness with Native Americans written out of the narrative arc of 19th century progressive historiography and becoming history's shadow, as one scholar writes, or relegated to colonial time. And it's a problem that contemporary historians continue to confront today. The past is imagined as occurring in two phases, the time of the natives, prehistory, followed by the time of the settlers, history, with these periods segregated conceptually. 
Native people are re represented as living at some distance away or res resolutely in the past. So the presence of Chief Joseph Strongwolf at these marker dedications is worth considering in this context. In this framework, he could be seen as standing in for Delaware, the Delaware as a kind of last Indian. Of course, his image also hearkened to Buffalo Bill shows, Indians in pageantry and early cinema. As the commission noted in their reports, his presence added much picturesque to the meanings, but he's presented too as a kind of symbol of a whole people, a symbol of them in the past. He seems to be passing Pennsylvania from native ownership to that of the white settler, here shaking hands with Pennsylvania Governor Fisher at the Kittening Indian Town marker. And this image was the front piece of the lavishly illustrated fourth annual report that Shoemaker and Myers put together at the end of their projects. In marker unveilings that discuss a Native American theme, and in particular those that discuss a transition of land ownership, the presence of someone like Strongwolf is almost necessary to allow settlers to imagine the transition of populations that they are directly or indirectly celebrating. These native figures never appear in contemporary dress. That would shatter the whole fantasy. Instead, they appear as if time traveling from some imaginary time and place. The Plains Indian dress Strongwolf wears was a common uniform that helped replicate this imagined Indian from beyond. Strongwolf's demeanor in most of the images is stern and serious. He is solemnly transferring land over to the white people gathered that day. His start of the marker dedications with an invocation to the great spirit would likely serve the white people gathered there as a reminder of the spirituality of Native American ancestors almost as if the great spirit herself was condoning the transfer of populations. Not only are many of the marker subjects about the last Native American in a region or the last villages, but we have represented here a kind of last Native American offering solemn ceremonies and smoking a peace pipe to wish the land's new owners well. Well, who was Joseph Strongwolf anyway? I have been working on this question for some time. I am trying to find out his actual affiliation and his actual name. He was a regular feature in Philadelphia events after 1922, and even to classes with anthropologist Frank Speck at the University of Pennsylvania. He was certainly a veteran of World War I, um, and press releases stated that he served in the Canadian in a Canadian regiment first, and then in American units when the U.S. entered the war. This story was not unique. There were more than 12,000 Native Americans who served in World War I, well before they became U.S. citizens in 1924. In many of his public talks at the meetings of Masons, the Society of the Red Men, school groups and alumni gatherings, Strongwolf advocated for a greater understanding for treatment of Native peoples as whole human beings and for Native American citizenship. He was likely Ojibwe, News accounts mention his origin in Wisconsin, but also in Oklahoma. He was alleged to have attended boarding school. One source says the Mohawk Institute in Brantford, Canada. Another says Carlisle. Another says the Haskell Institute in Oklahoma. He's also identified as Rappahannock. He may have encountered Myers in Philadelphia um, when Myers was bringing veterans on historical walking tours of the city, which is what he did during the war. He certainly had some measure of agency. He was paid for his service. He received $20 for attending the two walking purchase dedications in Northampton County, for instance. What he thought of these events is hard to say. He's described in some correspondence as Meyer's friend. And the off script images like this one suggest that traveling to the events may have been fun at some time. So now I'm gonna conclude. What then is this story about the Indian walk markers really about? This is a story about the decentralized nature of the public history apparatus through much of US history. Most markers were not developed through some lengthy process of consensus building as we see here, but rather were the efforts of a few individuals who had the time, the money, the personal inclination, or just the luck to be able to shape the landscape the way that they did. The story they tell is rarely vetted by others. 
In this case, I see little evidence of any correction to Meyer's proposed marker text, and he is working within the Pennsylvania Historical Commission. Myers was able to proceed even when others opposed him. He gave speeches, but they don't appear in the files and I haven't located them, so I'm not sure what they said. But he was well positioned and rarely questioned, it seemed, by the wider public and the business elites who funded his projects directly or through their membership on local historical and patriotic societies. So this is a story about powerful, the powerful role elites have played in shaping our public historical landscape. Many questions remain unanswered. Did Myers really find evidence in London of the missing 1686 treaty? If he did, would that even matter? Were his activities a way to vindicate members of the Penn's family and sanitize the story of the Quaker dispossession of the Delarandians? And what was his relationship to Joseph Strongwolf? While there are still many unanswered questions, it seemed to me that these markers should really be viewed as monuments to Albert Cook Myers. This is also a story of poorly funded agencies and bureaucratic disorganization. Later commissions and agency representatives rarely checked up on the markers that once they were established. The archives are full of letters of citizens alerting officials about a boulder that fell over or a plaque that got damaged. In 1961, for instance, the chairman of the Bucks County Historical Society, a woman finally, Ianne Hutton, wrote to the executive director of the newly reorganized Pennsylvania Historical Museum Commission to tell him that there was unsightly signage around the Indian Walk Monument. And she sent this image here to him in the mail. Little did he, she know that Stevens had a real chip on his shoulder about his predecessor, Shoemaker. He replied to Hutton, our position is that, is that of abandoning these old fashioned boulder and bronze type markers as completely useless, he writes, in terms of advising the traveler of places of historical interest. We have markers on the, pistol, on the walking purchase in our new roadside marker series, the signs, the blue signs. The best procedure would be to remove the existing marker, but I confess I do not quite know how to get it done, he writes. So this is also the story about kind of bureaucratic confusion. Finally, this is also a story about settlers trying to find a place of belonging in a land that they know is a homeland of another people. They need to find a way to write a story on the land that makes them feel like they belong there and offers a plausible reason for their presence. And maybe as some scholars say, offers a way to find a moral presence on that land. In his efforts, it could be that Myers was trying to remove a blemish on what he saw was an otherwise perfect pen track record or trying to represent Pennsylvania in some kind of positive light. So the story then is fundamentally about how white people ob obtained the land, how native people were removed and how other white people felt the story should be celebrated while even other white people did not. In their discussion of settler colonialism, decolonization is not a metaphor, Tuck and Yang raise the question of the settler colonist predicament and talk about settler moves to innocence. Was Myers engaged in a settler move to innocence? Or might we see Henry Chapman Mercer who tried to stop the walking purchase mar markers as making a different kind of move to innocence, a holier than thou attempt to position himself as more innocent than others? And where does the present talk feature in such a formulation? Finally, what are the consequences over the long term? I have found that there is real inertia in the historical landscape. People often want to repair damage markers just because they're damaged, not necessarily because they love the story that they tell. When this is what they learn from the land, they often build from there. I end this talk with an image from a brochure of a play carried out in the 1970s designed to educate young Americans about local history and the wrongs done to Native Americans in which the walking purchase was reenacted. In the end, it developed yet another program of white people playing Indian. All right, so that's the end of my talk. I will stop sharing and we'll have time for questions. 
Wonderful. Uh, thank you. <laughs> so uh, if you have some questions beyond what we got already, please type them into the Q&A button. Use the Q&A button to type them. Uh, maybe I kick off by that end because that, that was kind of what the kind of lingering question <laughs> I had throughout uh, your talk, uh, Professor Smith. Uh, it had to do with the performative kind of aspect of those monuments. Uh, and you you described you know the kind of the ceremony at the time uh, and uh, what the market around it and like was it celebrated were they celebrating uh, those monuments uh, throughout those years was there you know like thinking about those characters that uh, uh, were investing in different things so you know I'm kind of curious uh, if there was. Uh, you know, like that, that type of kind of, oh, it's going to be an annual income. <laughs> so we got, it's be we better put up something because, you know, like it, it sounds like a good investment. Uh, and uh, I, I wonder if there is any kind of uh, evidence that that was a motive uh, as well as just, you know, like to, to, to do it <laughs> because the names are going to be uh, there. Uh, and, and also reactions just general uh, to, to those beyond, you know, the, uh, the, the resistance to uh, build them or to sign the name of the society. But what about Native Americans uh, uh, thinking about this? Do you, can you share some of the information you got around? Yeah. yeah thank you. Sure, sure. Um, I haven't found any evidence of Native American protests at the time in the 20s. Um, uh, 20s were a really rough time. And so um, people were trying to, um, some, there, there was a lot of disputes about the citizenship law that came about in 1924. Other people were arguing for citizenship. There were meetings of um, Algonquin, whole groups of Algonquins trying to meet. So there was really attempts at really thinking about land. And so these historical markers, I did not see any evidence of any kind of um, conflict, but I, I'm not sure they were seen to be really the most pressing concerns, I guess is what I'm saying. Um, I also got the sense from looking at their archives that th th there was a real kind of acquisitive side to the commission so each group of commissioners, you know, you'd have four people, you'd serve for four years and you'd have another one for four years and another one. Sometimes they overlapped a little, but they were always looking at what the previous commission had done and who had done more than the next group. And so I got the sense they were just trying to develop as many markers as they could without really thinking about what to do with them once they developed them. So they're just constantly going across the land trying to develop more and not really concerned with preserving the ones that they had already developed. Um, so in this case, I don't see evidence of, of like reenacting this over and over again, except I did find that 1970s um, walking purchase play that was done. There was a whole play and a performance and a reenactment. Um, so I don't get the sense that these were regular rituals. I get the sense that they were almost more one-time events. So. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. Um, so I'm going to start reading the questions. Uh, Larry uh, is asking any comments on the 1913 monument erected by the Lehigh County Historical Society about the October 8th, 1763 deaths uh, of John Snyder and Anna Watring in uh, Egypt, PA, the last massacre in the county. Is this related to the walking purchase bootleg monuments? Thank you. Okay, so the night it was established in 1913. Mm -hmm. I didn't. Um, that was probably established. It was probably established before the historical commission. I have to take a look at that marker to see what it says on the marker, but I have a feeling that was probably established before the commission. Um, I would, ha I'd have to look that up, but I'd be happy to. Um, mm -hmm. Let me just get a pen. Excuse me. Uh, the event Sorry. is recorded all of it is going to be oh it's recorded. going to be recorded okay great yeah yeah i'd be happy to look that up sure um ilhan is asking what is your opinion general opinion about land acknowledgements uh and uh there may be the relationship uh between those statements and maybe what you were talking about uh and do you find them genuine ah that's it's a really good question and, you know, i think i think um they've really taken off and they can feel 
like you're doing enough by just saying something, right? So um, the, the, it can be a dangerous development if people are only just making a land acknowledgement with it, you know, so that's could be seen as a move to innocence as well. And I think somebody's even written about that. So land acknowledgements could be seen as just an attempt to kind of brush over something serious. Um, in Canada, it's almost commonplace to give land acknowledgements and somehow in the US it's a real, really slowly developing. Um, and, you know, I'm thinking about my own land acknowledgement. I felt like I should say something um, because of the subject of this talk and because of people who might be um, from any of these affiliated organizations, um, Native Americans, that is. Um, but yeah, that's a really good question. I don't think I don't think it should stop there. But on the other hand, if you don't give a land acknowledgement, you sort of forget, then you don't want to erase history either. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So Scott Gordon is asking, thank you, Scott, for uh, arranging this talk as well. Um, I really like your account of Chief uh, Joseph Strongwolf uh, as a representative of the last Indian. Uh, did the commission make any attempt to gain more representatives from the Leni -La uh, Lenape community that survived? Uh, were Leni Lenape ever the descendants uh, present at these monument erection ceremonies? Or were they always white descendants of the landowners? Yeah, it was mostly um, descendants of, that's a great question, thank you. Um, from what I've seen, it was almost entirely um, white descendants and landowners and historical society representatives. Um, if they were run by Daughters of the American Revolution, sometimes there were more kind of patri displays of patriotism, like singing of the national anthem or something like that. Um, and you see the Boy Scouts are there, and some of the members of the Star Commission talked about this as Americanization projects. Um, and so, you know, teaching people the, how to, the Pledge of Allegiance and that sort of thing would be part of the agenda. Um, if, but I didn't see evidence that a lot of these, these markers were not established in big city environments. And so they were not established in large environments. A lot of times they're out in rural areas. So it would be the families that were the farm families, whoever they happen to be. Um, there was a time when a few of these markers were established with a Delaware man who was from Oklahoma, who came to Philadelphia to work with Frank Speck. And he happened to be in the area. So the historical commission had him unveil a few of these markers. And I have an image of him where he's making a face, like it's a smirk. I mean, you can't think of it it's like he's sort of thinking, what in the world am I doing here? Um, and they had him also participate in a William Penn event as well. And the news definitely made a big deal saying he was a descendant of the people who actually, you know, were part of this, this massacre or part of this arrangement and so forth. Um, but he was only in them for a few times. So I didn't see any effort being made. It was more happenstance. This guy happened to be in Oklahoma, happened to be coming from Oklahoma, happened to be working with Speck. So they just happened to work with him. So, mm -hmm. uh, Paul and Susan Rump uh, say or ask um, that the mentality of which you have spoken among the elites in the growing Northeast gave rise to the eugenics project, which was most in practice from the late 1880s through 1940s and even later in some places. Your talk is superly, uh, superbly important toward a fuller understanding of this ironically tragic period for the region's natives. Thank you for the wonderful talk. Can you comment on that as, as like one of those, um, you know, the, the longitude? So what, where the context is? Uh, oh yeah, no, I think that's a great point. I mean, this is a time in the twenties where you have um, concern about immigration. You have concern about, um, I don't know, the mongrelization of American society. I mean, really horrible things are being written and, um, there's anti-immigration laws being passed. So I don't know the, um, most of the, the affiliations of people from the Pennsylvania Historical Commission, they even say they represent the early settlers of Pennsylvania. They represent Pennsylvania perfectly and it's Scotch, Irish, German, and French or something. And so <laughs> they don't see other, uh, other, immigrant populations as relevant and certainly not African-Americans and they don't have any Native Americans on the commission, right? So 
Um, there, I, I looked for evidence of some of these people getting involved in clan rallies and other kinds of events that are going on at this time, you know, so you have the clan starting to make a lot of inroads. And what is very strange, the only person I could see who spoke at a clan rally was actually Joseph Strongwolf. And I would love to find out what he said. Um, you know, he was speaking at any number of organizations. So I don't think it necessarily meant that he was a believer in their agenda. But um, this was definitely a time of, of a lot of tumultuous um, and kind of uber patriotic kind of activities. Mm -hmm. um, e. Fisher is, is asking, do you know of any current discussion happening surrounding the existence of the plagues? Uh, are these markers something local historical societies see as an issue they should address? Wait, I didn't quite understand your question. The question is what's happening right now? So like- are, Oh, are those, oh, uh, yeah. Are those plagues and uh, monuments being questioned? And is there a debate about how to preserve them? And uh, do you see that the historical societies, you know, are reacting to whatever, uh, you know, they've approved? <laughs> well, yeah, that's like, a really good question. Yeah, so around. the Bucks County Society is off the hook because it was the citizens who right. put up the markers. So. Um, Northampton, I should talk to them and see what they're thinking. Um, I actually have to do some site surveys because I could only locate one of the two in Northampton County. So I don't know. Um, what, I've, what I find though, is they tend to be in out of the way places and I'm not sure most people even know what they are or, so I haven't heard any, I haven't heard any um, concern about these actually. Interesting. But that's a great question, yeah. I, you know, now that now that I've just said what I've said, maybe <laughs> <laughs> maybe somebody hears us and be like, ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, Robert uh, McSherry is asking, is there any suspicion that there was a corrupt motive in the background for the walking purchase monument drive, such as some underlying monetary or other dispute? Ah, that's a really, that's a good question too. Um, I don't get the sense. I really think it has a lot to do with Myers trying to stake a place in Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, it, it whenever like when the mayor of Allentown heard about this, he was very interested in finding out more, and I think he was more concerned about um, <laughs> legitimacy of his his own, you know, his city's land claims, right? Like, okay, is this gonna be a problem for me? You know, so you get a sensitivity by landowners. Um, Fackenthal started doing this research because his family's land was right near a kind of a boundary. So a lot of people who are interested in tracing back their family story might come up against mm -hmm. some of the earliest um, landowners and sort of wonder, okay, is all of this like situated on a house of cards and they might be a little bit concerned there. So that's where a kind of financial story might be involved. But Myers, I think you get, <laughs> Myers is constantly writing to people saying, you didn't give me credit in your footnote for having discovered this town or that town, <laughs> you know, well, you didn't. So he's, he's constantly trying to get his name out there. And so I got the sense it was much more about Myers trying to, um, tell Pennsylvania's history the way he wanted to tell it. Yeah. Yeah, uh, uh, Howard White actually mentions a healing service walk that was held uh, the other year uh, uh, that is related to, to th those. Oh, books. yeah. Uh, that's fascinating, good to, good to know about that. Yeah, I didn't know about that, that's great. And, and um, th 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 there was another uh, coming from uh, Lisanne uh, Hurst here about competing kind of uh, organizations or even within the, the organization. You know, if you have like a, kind of the, the rush to put up monuments and you have in the same space, you know, one monument for this and the other monument for another cause. And, you know, so, so how... What, what happens when there are competing organizations that are attempted to do a lot, whatever, for whatever reason? And uh, was there anything like that related to, to, this, to those monuments? 
That's well, another. not with the Wacky Purchase, but you certainly PlayWiki. Um, well, yeah, yeah, PlayWiki, definitely there was competition, you know, and, and the commission wins out. Um, and I think for the most part, though, uh, I'm trying to think of locations where I've seen multiple markers. Um, you may have multiple chapters of the DAR trying to commemorate a similar part of the Revolutionary War story in a similar region. And so, but they, but they're already divided into sort of regional, they each have their own turf. And so the way they're set up, they each have like kind of regional turf. And so they'll only put markers in their turf for the most part. And so I, so they might put markers near each other's turf, but they would tend to cooperate more than, than compete. But it does seem kind of absurd really this um, this competition to um, try to get more markers up than the last commission. And um, it, it costs a lot of money to put up a marker at that time and now. And so I think that's the limiting factor. So. Mm -hmm. um, maybe one, two more questions. <laughs> uh, th that goes back to the actual uh, purchase uh, or that idea. Do we know the actual path of the walking purchase trail? Is is there like evidence? Say, you know, it's a little controversial on that map with those dotted lines, and you know, the day they, they try to jot down. But uh, is it those monuments are actually kind of reflecting anything? No, I don't think that they're necessarily. Um, that was another complaint that Myers had in the archives. I don't think they necessarily. They, they, the markers state very clearly, this is exactly where, or ten, you know, not far from here was this, or this was at a tree where this, but I don't think they really had any sense. And I think they just made it up and they just guessed. Um, and sometimes they, they were very far off and it was just depending on where they could get the land, who was willing to, who was willing to give them a deed, where the roads were. A lot of times they were just based on where transportation was. One of the complaints Mercer had, Mercer wanted the play wiki marker in the field where he found the site. And Myers wanted it on the road where people could stop and whatever. And so they, you had those kind of factors that would determine where it was. I don't know of, it would take a lot to try to retrace where it was. And I'm not sure it's even possible. I, I talked to um, Ben Carter's a local archeologist who might have a better sense of that. Um, if you would have to have some maps and I don't know if anybody would be able to do that with old maps and the current topography. Yeah. Okay. We have a few more questions. We're not gonna to get to them uh, and, and I'm sorry about that. There is one more uh, question maybe we finish with. Sure. Uh, is the historical commission in the process of rewarding uh, some, not rewarding, but rewarding <laughs> uh, some of the state markers. Uh, are you aware of like a, a, an interest in changing what is up there, what is written up? That is a great question. I do not know. I know that um, there are various kinds of um, warnings when you go to the archives, we'll say, you're going to find language that you're not going to like in some of our documents, you know? And so, but that is a really good question. The problem is I don't think they know where they all are. Right. So even the books that try to outline where these different markers are located are always incomplete. Um, and there seems to be little attempt to try to track them down, but that, that would be, <laughs> that would be a great project for somebody to try to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a great question. Okay, well, thank you. That's definitely not a, a complete uh, a debate and, and uh, talk. And uh, well, we hope to continue uh, this theme and talk more about uh, ways to uh, memorize and think about uh, uh, issues that uh, really cause pain uh, to people. Uh, and I, I really wanna thank you uh, for, for, for this talk. 
Uh, lots of people uh, said that it was wonderful, so <laughs> I agree. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you for the time uh, with us today. I before you go, uh, the thirty something people that are still here, thank you for sticking around. Uh, so this is uh, if you follow the link, uh, you're gonna see some uh, advertisement for the events in the end of the month for the National Poetry Month. Uh, and we have rich program near the end of the month that we, we invite you to, to come and join us uh, for. So have a great evening and thank you for joining us. And thanks again, uh, Professor, for, for the talk. Thank and, you very uh, much. Have a nice. Thank you. That was great. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay.